let's try that. So, so I had a couple of other other places that I've um, that uh, that I bought things. So I have a couple of things uh, things to show you. And so MCM Electronics, I, I see you didn't have. This is another hobbyist one. And they have turntable belts, all kinds of things that you can get. You showed Mauser last week. We can go to these websites, and then here's the here's the big one. They have like 44 million parts, and it takes you an hour to find out which one. And Newark and Allied Electronics are also really big ones. Uh, Technic Tools uh, is a great place to go shopping. Uh, if you're going to build anything, you've got to have good tools. So you can go to Technic Tools. They even have so many things that you never even heard of. How many people have ever heard of a pyro pen? Is it? Who knows what a pyro pen is? Is that exactly what it does? What a pyro pen is, is a soldering iron. Oh, it's powered with the butane. Yes. You go to this thing here. You got it. Okay. The first kill on your block is one of these things. Now, why would you need a why would you need a butane powered soldering iron? Why not? Why would you? That's the other thing. Well, so for years I worked in an accelerator that was three miles around, and you go into this big tunnel that was like a big sewer pipe, ten feet in diameter. It was a hard to find a place to plug things in. And we had solid connections. I can't tell you how many times we used one. I never heard of this device before until I hired a guy that uh, worked at a worked for a company that installed climate equipment. So he would go out and feel. He would climb 100 foot towers and put in the, uh, the name of the company was called Climatronics. He'd be soldering soldering connections uh, standing on top of a 100 foot tower uh, to uh, to measure uh, weather around airports and things. But this thing is a profoundly useful device if you have to uh, make connections and you're far away from. Other all kinds of useful tools that uh, you can get back and make Okay, there you go. So these things that uh, you touched on last week, we went to them, but MCM is another one uh, that, that I didn't see on your list. That's a really good one. I bought stuff from all these guys, and they're really good, um, including the list on the bottom of the page. Now here's some that uh, that you didn't put up that we didn't talk about last week. So these are these are uh, some. You guys are in the audio club, and these uh, houses are uh, related to audio and specifically vacuum tubes. And um, so the top of Mojo Tone uh, is a place that's an authorized Fender distributor. And I, I found out about them from Fender because I was fixing a guitar amplifier for a friend of mine with, you know, four 10-inch drivers in it. And professional musicians are very hard on equipment there. Uh, this thing looked like somebody threw it out of the lettuce truck and dragged it on the ground. <laughs> he gave it to me crying, and I had to fix it. And the back, the back of this thing was broken. And I had to go to Mojo Tone. Uh, I called Fender, and they saw, called those guys, and I had to take them in to measure this thing out and tell them where the screw holes were. And they sent me like 15 bucks to just fit exactly in. I had to glue the whole case together and you know, did a massive repair on this thing. Uh, the other two are pretty much self-evident. They're for buying tubes. But these guys I really like here, Antique Radio Supply. You can go visit their website here real quick. Um, they have a lot of stuff that, uh, that, the, that the other guys don't have. They have toll lights and all kinds of things to make uh, uh, make guitar nice. But uh, this is a nice place. Antique Radio Supply is also called Tubes and More. But they have vacuum tubes and speakers and, uh, and all kinds of all kinds of things here. They, they can sell you match tubes and whatever else you're looking for. Sometimes we'll uh, talk about how important it is to match tubes and, and uh, things. But these are specifically related to you know guitar amplifiers and uh, audio amplifiers. And have all kinds of things that, uh, that I found useful over the years. I like doing business with these guys if I can. This guy here, Hoffman Amps, um, I, I put down here for expert only because it's not like the big house like the GE or MCM or Ally. He's one guy, I think he's in North Carolina, that has this warehouse and uh, he sells parts. And he's actually really good and very competitive. Um, he's a little, uh, I don't want to say tough to get a hold of. He certainly responds to emails. But at one point he gave me his personal email. Um, I was I, I, found him very, he was uh, really engaged in the empire that I was rebuilding. But there's lots of little bits that you can get from this guy and uh, that, that uh, nobody else has. But you'll also find on here, he has kits. Mojo Dome has a kit for a, a big fender amplifier. You can have a thousand bucks laying around, you can build this thing. But he also has amps that you'll see on the web, uh, Hoffman amps, um, and quite a lot of other things for, for two amp ceramic sockets and all kinds of neat things. So this is a good guy to go to if you're a big project you're working on. Parts Express has been around a long time. Um, they have stuff, they have tubes. Uh, they're also, I found out that they also have, if you're making speakers and you have to get some parts for your router uh, to cut holes in speaker cabinets, they have, they have a lot of stuff, tools that are specific to making speakers, so it's a really good place to go. And I discovered this place, I have some speakers that I need to recone. And uh, so I'm, I'm on the web looking for speaker repair, and I found this guy, he's in Michigan. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. 
But this, right away, I like this guy. I want to go visit him. He's in Grand Rapids. Not open on the weekend, so i got to take a day off work. But this is the guy I want to go visit to. He comes some speakers that I have. And uh, my girlfriend had a pair of AR speakers that were in her dad's garage. And I went to turn them on, and the combs literally just fell right out of the driver. There was no driver on it. So I called him. I try to do business with the local guys if I can, so I'll let you know how that works out with the circuit shop. Okay, um, this is a custom amplifier shop. There are people all over the place that make amplifiers, but you know, I'm a little jaded with this stuff. There's nothing new in tune since the 1920s. But these guys, the airtight garage, he's in Baton Rouge, and I almost went to visit him. And the only thing that stopped me from visiting him, I rode a motorcycle to New Orleans, and the only thing that stopped me from visiting him was uh, Hurricane Katrina. I mean, that thing did, I got my bike and I headed the other direction. So, uh, but he makes absolutely beautiful cabinets, and these things are thousands of dollars. I don't know if there's any difference between something like this and a, um, a Fender Blues Junior. Um, I really don't know, but a Fender Blues Junior doesn't look like this. I have one, and uh, I'd like to have one of these someday. But, uh, so when you're making a, a project, you know, you know, it might not be completely original or your circuit design or something, but you certainly can package it like this. It would be really nice. The people read about these things. Um, he puts a lot of time into them. And I, I used a little bit of information from, from him on the web here that we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, so I wanted to give a little bit of advice because I've been doing this a long time. And uh, I just figured if you guys are building your projects, it always helps if you keep a notebook or a, some kind of file folder on projects that you build. Because uh, you know, when you get to be my age, you forget stuff. And I know, think, what did I do back then? What problems did I have? And how did I solve it? And uh, once you get into this habit, you go back to it a year from now and you look at something, you realize how important that is. Maybe not a notebook, because a notebook, if you're doing ten things, is kind of hard to you know discombobulate things. But I put file folders on all the projects that I did. Uh, I spent a summer rebuilding amplifiers and, uh, for a friend of mine, and uh, and it'll help you track changes and remember things. Uh, if you are working on tuned circuits, you know, they're high impedance circuits and high voltages, and, uh, and you know, these things can surprise you because they surprise me many times. Uh, they contain some stored energy that can, uh, that can uh, hurt you. Um, learn how to solder correctly. Uh, I can't overemphasize this in terms of your projects and how reliable, um, how, how good it is to have reliable connections and how much bad connections can torment you for, can torment people for years. Uh, I've had people throw things in my direction, and I've thrown things in other people, other people's directions that were the uh, that were the uh, problems of just a bad solder joint. Uh, and also lead, you know, in case you don't know, it's a toxin. It's not something you want to really put your hands on that much, and you want to get rid of. I don't know what the the uh, rules are in Michigan, but if you can get rid of it in New York, we were we could uh, we could recycle it separately. So we, the technicians had cups on their desk, and you would, when you use the solder sucker, they would put the uh, expose the material, and then somebody would come and collect it. And, um, and dispose of it. Now here's some other interesting stuff that, um, that you might be interested in. Um, when you try and build a laboratory on your own, take measurements. We'll talk about uh, some measurements that I'd like to take on things. It's good to have a, uh, a source of this stuff. This company, Daytac, is very interesting. Um, um, I don't know if I've ever used any of their stuff, but they have data acquisition things starting at $29. These are all PC compatible and they come with software. And, uh, and so you can make little scopes out of them and uh, for $59. It was one kit that they, that they gave away to people. It, it went into the nine, nine pin serial port and it, it had a couple of analog channels on it, a couple of digital. One friend of mine went around and looked all of us and we all ordered it. And he, I think he wired his whole house up to this thing and I, I don't know, I ended up getting my own way. But uh, this is a very interesting company. You might want to take a look at this sometime if you think about taking measurements. You can make a scope out of these things, a DC based scope it looks like for uh, very little money. Uh, you can get decent bandwidth out of it, and they come with their own analysis software. So, um, just, a, just a thing you might want to uh, consider. Uh, this, this is, I put Miracle Spray. I read about this stuff years ago, and, and I thought that it really wasn't a very valuable tool. And as it turns out, I was wrong. Uh, we started using this at Brookhaven Laboratory because we, have a, we had a, a, a system for door into locks and things to prevent people from going into certain rooms that were that was uh, based on relays, and this interlock system was built in the 60s and 70s, and until recently, before it was replaced with computers, and those connections were just always giving them a hard time, and what they did was they uh, just discovered this stuff and started spraying things down, plugs and plugging them in and out, and it fixed their connections, and I started using this, 
if you think about a guitar amplifier, an audio amplifier, pins and sockets and tubes, there's, you know, there's many connections that are, a sonic connection is a more reliable connection. You're melting metal on metal with proper flux, you get this connection to last. But a pin and socket is a hard connection to get to last for a long period of time. And, uh, and so if you're building a guitar amplifier, I use this stuff on very, I have some amplifiers from the mid-60s that uh, were not quite as old as me, but, um, but they have benefited. I have fixed things literally by spraying the stuff onto the contacts and into the potentiometers and brought things back to life. So it's a cheap way to get a guitar amplifier if somebody hands you something that's broken. Um, this is another tool that I'm thinking of getting here. I've, I've talked to the professor about this, comparing to the network analyzer, the spectrum analyzer that you guys have in your lab. This is a PC-based program that, you, that uses the internal sound cards, the uh, analog output and analog analog input for your uh, for your microphone connection, your sound card. And it also uses, you can also configure it to use external sound boards. I have a 24-bit digitizer from Creative. I'm going to try and see if it's compatible with this thing because uh, we'll, we'll test it against the, the uh, spectrum analyzer up in the uh, up in the lab and we'll try and compare it. But this is something that you get PC-based. Let me just see if I can get some screenshots here. It'd be really nice to be able to do this on my PC. I've thought about getting something like this for years because like, we talked last time I was here about measuring transfer function. Talk about how important that is to characterize something electrically and then listen to it and hear it to like it. They're two very different measurements, but I always like to have some kind of electrical measurement that I can go back to and say, okay, I measured this and I like the way this sounded, and I measured this and I didn't like the way it sounded. And so at least I can keep a record of it here. So I'm considering buying this and uh, and, and, uh, and seeing if it's actually a useful tool. But uh, I, I put this out there for you guys and get some time to take a look at this thing. There's a couple of options that we have to get with an audio analysis package and distortion software. And then uh, we'll see how good the internal sound cards and the computers are versus the external ones. But they give you a 30 day free trial, so we're going to be testing this out when I get some free time. And, uh, and okay, I don't bouncy around here a little bit. Like I said, I just sort of typed at my desk. And if I would think of something, I would put it on here. Another miracle, I should group the miracle products together. But uh, anybody use a transistor mounted to a heat sink in your project? Anybody see a transistor out to the heat sink? So you have to put something between the transistor and the heat sink, right? An insulator. And unfortunately, good electrical insulators are, are bad, bad thermal insulators are also bad electrical insulators and vice versa. So if you want to insulate for electricity, then you're also going to block heat. Then sort of by definition. But so they come up with a series of products now, you have to put that grease in between. So they come up with a product now, you can take a look at this. It took me a long time in the DigiKey catalog to find this stuff, and I called this company. Layered products, and I finally found this stuff, and I put it in a couple of things that I fixed. I called T guard. I called it brought up the keep the virus. <laughs> keep the virus. <laughs> Is it gonna bring it up? Put it down. Right. 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 You have to just bring things up. But anyway, so this is a thermally conducted insulator. Now, it's the, it effectively has grease on it already. And, um, and so it's an insulator, but it's only one mil thick. It'll hold off 4,000 volts. So it's very thin compared to a mica insulator or plastic. And uh, it's also got tremendous uh, thermal conductivity. And the other thing that this thing does, it has a phase change material on it. So it sort of melts itself into place. So uh, a heat sink and a transistor, they're not perfectly flat. And, and so you put these things together, and the first time it heats up, it melts itself into place. And really gives you good thermal conductivity. I put this on a base amp that I had, and I cannot believe the difference it made in terms of how cool my transistors are and how hot my heat sink got. So I really did a nice job of getting the heat out of the transistors onto the heat sink, which is where it belongs. So you can compare the specs here against some other things, but I got, I, I'm going to dump any projects I do in the future, I'm going to dump the plastic and mica insulators get a sheet of stuff and cut out what I need and, uh, and use this instead. So that was some random stuff. And so one of the things I want to ask you guys then, if you have an idea, of, we talk about the amplifiers and audio, it's very, uh, you know, people always keep you subjective and objective measurements. So you've got to understand the difference between an objective and a subjective measurement. A subjective measurement is based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. An objective measurement is not influenced by personal feelings or opinions considering and representing facts. Unless you're a politician, there are strict rules that apply to these uh, definitions here. So let me give you some examples and see if you guys can tell me which is which. 
Have you ever heard anybody say, I like the way this amplifier sounds? So that is a subjective measurement. Or, I hate the way this amplifier sounds. So that is a subjective measurement. All right, I measure 10 watts and 8 ohms. That is an objective measurement. And you also hear people, any adjective you put in here, it sounds muddy, clear, bright, this, that, no. Those are all subjective measurements. I measured 1% total harmonic distortion at 10 watts and 8 ohms with a 1 volt pitch and 1 kilohertz sine wave. That is an objective measure. So, so as an engineer, I'd like to have objective measurements. And then I take my creation and have people listen to it and, and then tell me if they like it or not. Because sometimes you know, we can pour our heart to things as engineers and have people say, you know, I just don't like the way that sounds, man. But I've had people, people listen to things that I've done and say, that thing's never sounded better to me. I've had no idea why. But, so from this website that I showed you, the airtight garage, these guys all write about their amplifiers and tube thoughts. And you'll read about people's opinions all the time of these subjective things. But without trying to read this whole thing, he says, I used to own a very high-end tube amplifier. I bought it from a friend of mine. And I needed to change the tubes. I called the factory. And they recommended to me a company known to be bottom of the line. I love that. OK, so I thought they were nuts. So I had a top of the line tubes matched. And we'll talk about why this is important. I installed them and set the bias, and it sounded really bad. Is that a subjective measurement or objective measurement? That is subjective, right? It's interesting, he's doing something technical here, and then he gives you a subjective answer. And then he says, I couldn't believe it. I checked the bias and did it again. And I said, my amplifier sounded dead. Another subjective measurement. And I compared the two to the old ones from the house and the company. I decided to put the cheapies in, and they sounded great. My lifeless sound, sound stage was now, this is all subjective. And his friends got tired of telling the story, and I'm an audiophile from the 70s, and I'm tired of hearing stuff like this. Because it would have been great if he said, I measured this parameter, and it totally different from the parameter on which these tubes were designed. But this is a good sentence down here where he says, he says, notation is that some tubes are much better in some circuits than others, regardless of who made them. That's a very important sentence because some things work better or designed around the tubes and their characteristics and others. What I think would have been an interesting experiment for him to change the bias and listen to it and take some measurements and see if it sounded any different because maybe it needed to be biased differently. Or maybe some values around the tube uh, needed to be changed. But, but this is what we have, and you hear this a lot in audio, that you, you see highly subjective measurements or you read a technical article that you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Never somewhere in between. So, so I've been thinking all these years about measurements that I can take on amplifiers and think about what are the objective ones that I can take, as well as the subjective measurements. Then I'm going to listen to the product and hear how good it is. So one noise is one. Total harmonic distortion is one. And IMD, very important, intermodulation distortion. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, power level, gain phase, what we call the transfer function, and, uh, and transient response. And I'm sure that there's others. And how many people know what intermodulation distortion is? So total harmonic distortion an amplifier's response to a single tone, and it multiples at that frequency of that tone that appear that, that weren't there on the original input. Now, you know that real life isn't like that. Music isn't like that. Music has multiple tones, and it has all kinds of things happening. The bass drum is hitting. There's all kinds of frequencies. There's a spectrum. Intermodulation distortion happens when you have two or more tones put together in all harmonics that, uh, that are associated with them. Wiki, I just, you know, you guys are so lucky. We didn't have we didn't have Wiki back in the day, but there's so much information on the web. This is a perfect picture of IMD right here. This is very important uh, in audio response and even RF response because here's two tones that are close together, and here's two sidebands that come up out of nowhere. They weren't there on the original tones, but these are sidebands. What's important about this in RF is you have a transmitter or something. I have power that's associated with what I'm putting out on my antenna, but my amplifier is putting out power in somewhere where it's not supposed to be putting out power. So this is important. My amplifier is doing something other than what I told it to do. And this is a product, this is a result of IMD. And I have seen IMD where you have multiple spurs going out all over the place. And uh, the amplifier, the amplifier uh, manufacturers want to give you only the good numbers. They never want to tell you that the limit, there are actually real limitations on how amplifiers work in terms of what its total power is that it's putting out. So I would I would have been interested to see if the guy that put those tubes in that he didn't like would have measured them to see what the total harmonic distortion was or the modulation distortion, just to do a comparison against the original tubes. Or even more, more interestingly, if he was not able to measure any difference between these tubes, but they sounded completely different, I would have also thought that was very interesting. But the result is in the audio circuit, the reason I copied this in here is that 
is that intermodulation products are non-harmonically related to the input frequencies and therefore off-key with respect to the common Western musical scale. It sounds bad. If, you're, if you have something that has a lot of IMP, I interpret this as saying it sounds bad. So it could be that that fellow that had those tubes in there and that circuit was producing a bunch of tones that, uh, that it wasn't supposed to. Now there are a lot of things that can affect how an amplifier sounds. Uh, so you mentioned last week you were going down resistors and you said, I don't know, there's so many different types of resistors. There, resistors are like religion, okay? I gotta buy a guitar amplifier, I wanna put a carbon resistor in it because it's supposed to sound better. Well, if you read these things, I'm not gonna go over them in great detail. If you read this guy, gives a really, a really good description of this beacon hands. I just found this on the web because he's an engineer trying to tell people, look, it's not a good idea to use carbon resistors because they, they, uh, they have a lot of noise associated with it, and here's why. And noise is something that your amplifier is doing other than, I want an amplifier to do exactly what I tell it to do, not what it feels like doing on its own. Uh, but some people find that if the amplifier has distortion, the distortion may actually sound good, it may actually sound pleasurable. And, uh, and so some things may sound better because they have inferior components in it, but as an engineer, I sort of find that hard to believe. I'm always trying to make things sound, the input to be an exact replica, the output to be an exact copy of the input. Other things that are sort of like religion here are the use of components here, and, and you guys will find these a lot in, uh, in audio circuits. This 4558 is an industry standard chip that you'll find, and rather than go to the data sheets here, we can go to the, uh, the website on Mauser and just look at this really quickly, the difference between them. Because um, it's kind of hard to determine from the data sheet what the differences are, but it's important to know what you're doing. The bottom line is, this one's 42 cents, this one's four dollars, and so why is there a difference in the cost, and what does that have to do with the uh, with the sound quality? So let me tell you something that I did once. These things are, appear in every piece of audio equipment that I own. They're in my bass amplifiers. They're in my mixer. They're in, 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 in everything that I found, from Fender to PV to Carbon. And I fixed a PV bass amp for um, for a friend of mine that uh, that a whole group of bass players were. Uh, one guy builds basses. Uh, and uh, one guy's a famous bass player from Australia, and another guy I know. I took this bass amp, and uh, just the potentiometers were bent. Nothing was wrong with this thing, but somebody bent, bent them. I replaced all the pots. And while I was in there, I did an experiment. I took out all the four, five, five, eights, and I put in the OPA 27s, and I played it. I, I, I could not believe the difference. You're hearing a highly subjective thing here. In how much different that amplifier sounded with the two chips. In. And it seemed, it seemed quieter with these, and I didn't have any measurement devices in my basement at the time. And it seemed quieter with these guys, and then I realized it's just not putting out distortion. It's not, it's not putting out noise. And this was better. I didn't tell them what I did. I gave it back to them. And I don't know, a couple months later, I went over to that guy's house, and the three of them were standing around this thing going, well, I don't know what you did with this thing, but it sounds unbelievable. And all I was supposed to have done was change the pots. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can do to your circuit, but I never took a measurement bill. So I'd like to sometime get these things going to take a four, five, five, eight. If somebody can spring for the four bucks, maybe I'll do it. I'll buy one of these things. And we'll, we'll put them on a bench and we'll make some simple circuits out of them and we'll characterize them and see how they work. And you'll find these things in a lot of effects pedals. So I, did, I did some reading on the web. People build these things into effects pedals because they distort, but people like the way they sound when they distort. But when I'm building an audio amplifier, if they're in a mixer, if, if somebody, I have a singer that sings to, uh, I don't want it to distort. I want it to make a faithful re reproduction of the signal coming out. That's what's coming into it. So I'm going to take my mixer apart and I'm going to scrape together some money and I'm going to put a whole bunch of those in there to see if it changes the way it sounds. And I, I put these links on here if you guys want to, uh, in your spare time, take a look at these things and go down the, uh, down the line. But that's basically all I have. Uh, I can do uh, talks in the future if you guys would because, like, like I said, I've, I put a bunch of tube amps. I fixed some tube amps and I also have some tube amps that were working until I fixed them and now they're broken. And I can, it's therapeutic, I can get up in here and talk to you guys about that. I've also fixed some soft data amplifiers, and uh, we can, you guys are interested, I can tell you about some of the projects that I've done. And I have some things that are still new art that I'd like to bring here. I have a little back and tube radio from Pioneer from the early 60s, in which stereo was an option, that board is screwed in there, it's all done in tubes. And um, someday I'd like to I'd like to rebuild that thing if I get some time. And that's, that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Go ahead. Can you send this to us? Email. Well, I sent it. Yeah. I sent it to the professor. So it'll, it'll be with the, the with the video on, on the homepage. There'll right. be a link for his uh, talk. It's, it's, it's with all of other talks too. Okay. Yeah. I'm just Russo and Efrid. If you have any questions for me, if I can help you, and if you have any questions, if I put something in here wrong or something. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah.
You know that spray works that fixes the connections? The oxy spray, yeah. Um, I would recommend using it. Um, I have a, I've used it in my car. I've had bad connections. I think it's just sitting outside the salt, just straight in there. Is it, is it just clean the connection? I don't know exactly what it does. It tells you, the first time I read it, it says it improves electrical connections. I'm thinking, well, they spray some electrically conducted contact. It can't possibly work. And I don't know what it, I don't know how it does what it does. But it works. I can, I, so I, I haven't done like a double blind study to try to stuff Radio Shack or brake cleaner. But this actually has some kind of lubricant in it. And so it leaves behind an oily film. And it leaves, leaves behind something that, uh, that lasts. And not just because we use it in the government doesn't mean it's the best, you know, it's the best. But I have used it, and uh, it's used on some very old contacts. And, and sometime when I talk about some of these amps that I fixed, I, somebody gave me a, a, a Blues Junior, which is like a $500 amp. And, uh, and, uh, and he put about $500 of modifications in it. And, and the guy who did the modifications really screwed the thing up. And he says, I'll just give it to you 100 bucks and it's yours. And I bought it. And I, between the spray and Resoldering the inside of that thing is absolutely amazing. I have it in my house. So, uh, was it the spray or was it the soldering? You know, I don't know. I just made, made this a like religion now. I take an old amplifier apart, spray it, clean down the contacts. I don't know exactly how it does, but it does. It's the short -hand So it's not conductive if you use it, say, like on a car with a lot of connections. It's not going to short it. If you look at their website, they have they're spraying it on edge connectors. So we use it on a lot of edge connectors. Two, I took a two. It has an oiler and a spray for getting the dirt out. I put the oil on it. I plug the tube in and out five times and put the cover on it. And I'm assuming that contact is good to go. I don't know exactly what's in it. Have you ever had any bad experiences buying stuff? Uh, so so at, at Brookhaven Laboratory, we had there's a, there's a lot of counterfeit parts out there. And so that's why it's good to stay with a reputable guy. The, the eBay guy <laughs> like, show it. So I'm thinking 30 cents for an LED, that's not bad. And you showed me one for three cents. So we, had, we had about a thousand circuit boards made at Brookhaven Laboratory and they didn't work. And, uh, and this one component was determined to be faulty. We took it out, they x-rayed it, and it was just, it was empty inside. It was just leads coming out. So it was a counterfeit component. You read about these things, but it happened to us. It happened to the big guys. And, uh, we bought it from a reputable place and they took them all back. And they so it happens to me professionally. Personally, it's never happened to me. I've never had, uh, I don't buy that much stuff personally. I, I, don't know. I try and use things when I get them so I know. You know, uh, and most of the guys, like I was a little worried about this guy hopping in. It's like, you know, he's a one, one show guy. But I think if you had a problem with his stuff, as long as you didn't, you know, told him right away, he would take care of it. Just, I, was, I don't know about the eBay guy, you know. I understand you guys are students and this ain't money. leaving something back there. You can even have an oil. So you can leave and put the stuff on it. So I, you know, you don't want to leave too much oil on because that attracts dust or a circuit board. But I, I agree with you. Those things, they had a problem with these these uh, contacts. They have to take these boards out. We used to use an eraser to erase these uh, boards and put them back in these edge connectors and they started using that spray all that stuff right away. So I don't know if we could use three and one on it if that would work. But this stuff seems to do it. So we should get sponsorship because I use that stuff too. <laughs> yeah, we should. Uh, if you'd like to start building, for example, uh, like some like a solid state or a two band, uh, what is the best way to actually start, like to get all the theory together? To well, you're in the right place, I think. Right, <laughs> Michigan State University in the audio club. That's a good question. It's like, you know, where do you start working on cars? But I always looked at things that other people did before, you know. And we can talk about different amplifier types because they're very complicated. If you have you talk, you know about different amplifier classes. Class A, Class B, A, B, Class C. Have you guys talked about that kind of stuff? So learn about the different types of amplifier classes and, and how things work, learn your theory, and then, and then try and get in there and look at existing equipment like the Defender Chant. When I saw that thing, that thing's absolutely perfect to look at. It's simple and it's uh, look at what other people have done and then figure out ways of copying it. That's just like music or something. You, you imitate it and then you get creative and you design your own stuff after.
I'm just going to say I have a bucket of OPA 27s if you want to try it. Excellent. <laughs> we should do it. Now you save you four bucks. Maybe we can lunch or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we had, I had a blind survey. Most guys absolutely love that. I think it's a far superior component from the noise to the reaction current and everything is far superior. But it'd be nice to measure it and see exactly what it does. There. Yes, I guess I have a question about uh, capacitors like, um, you know, in crossovers for the speakers, people will, you know, spend $20 on their capacitors yep. and things. Yep. I mean, is there so that is, a, I, I left capacitors conspicuously off the list here, but I did, I did mention that capacitors are important. The coupling capacitors, okay, maybe I didn't state it, but coupling capacitors carry the signal from one stage to another. Very, very important. And uh, I just want to tell a little story. I, I, I couldn't find the information on the web. I know I have a paper. So we talked about transfer function, right? We talked about copying something. Years ago, there was this audio manufacturer called Mark Levinson. And Levinson created these class A amplifiers that were the 70s, $5,000 for a 30 watt cube, and it was huge. Class A amplifier. And a guy named, I think it was George Carver, he came out with his own amplifier. Different, A, class A, B, just like everything you've seen here. Totally different topology, and he connected his amplifier backwards to a uh, uh, Mark Levinson through a speaker, and they should produce the same output, so he had this totally distorted output. If both amplifiers were doing the same thing, the speaker wouldn't produce any noise. He amplified the difference between them. And he took his amplifier and he modified it. No topology changes, only component changes. And the first thing he changed were capacitors. He took out his crappy coupling capacitors and he put polystyrene in, which were these $25 capacitors. And he was able to cut the, the difference between his amplifier and the other amplifier down to zero. And then he did a blind survey of, and got an audio expert in who could not hear the difference between a $5,000 amplifier and a $500 amplifier that had 10 times the power and cost one tenth the price. The biggest thing that he changed the capacitors. So we can talk about capacitors next time. So I think they actually do make a difference because capacitor is not a capacitor. Capacitor has effective series resistance, it has dissipation factor, it has all kinds of things in it that are secondary effects that really change the whole circuit that, that you're putting there. And so I built a set of speakers when I was 15 years old. I used oil-filled paper, so my, my capacitors were that big. The scramble line inductors, and I tried to put the best components in. And uh, so I think that those things can actually make a big difference in the sound. Because you can measure the difference between a polystyrene capacitor and a ceramic capacitor. So likely it doesn't make a difference. So is it the type capacitor then? Or? It's, the, it's the dielectric. It's the way the capacitors are manufactured. The dielectric is polystyrene. It's the, and, uh, people are actually using not, not um, they take a mylar film and they'll vapor deposit metal on it versus using an actual piece of metal in between two pieces of plastic. So these capacitors you're talking about, these music capacitors, Huge cylinders for small batteries. They're much bigger. People want, you can get electrolytic capacitor, you tiny little thing, but electrolytic capacitors have different properties associated with them. They're not good in AC circuits. Uh, but, but the speaker manufacturers did use this by using this double ended design. There's just the interruption zero, so there's lots of distortion. They distort like crazy, but they're cheap and small. So, um, so they do make them electrically, you know, you might measure, you might see 10 microfarads on two different capacitors, but. Electrically, they're very different devices, and they don't behave the same. So we can talk. About, I was going to say a whole. We could do a whole thing on just talking about casters, the audio amplifier.